period. So my talk consists of two parts. First, a shorter part, which is an overview of the NERC uh, environmental data service uh, landscape uh, and the context in which we operate. And then um, a bit of a meatier part, second part about our services with a particular focus on best practice guidance and, and training. Uh, Emma already mentioned that uh, the Environmental Data Service consists of uh, five data centers. So I've just put uh, in the beginning a little diagram of who we are. So uh, the uh, British Oceanographic Data Center, UK Polar Data Center, us at the NGDC, so the National Geoscience, uh, Environmental Information Data Center, and finally the uh, Center for Environmental Data Analysis. You can find more on, on the website about all of those. Uh, and uh, also to keep an eye, we have a new brochure website coming up very uh, soon in the future. So uh, also keep an eye out for that. So uh, the uh, EDS is a network of uh, data centers uh, maintained by NERC, which provides access to the scientific information and data which NERC have funded. Uh, a key uh, element of uh, this uh, context is the NERC data policy, which we've had in place for years now. We were one of the first uh, organizations to have one. Uh, and the key points in the policy, uh, which I would like to flag up, are that if you are a NERC funded researcher, uh, you must offer the data you generate uh, to the EDS for curation and also to enable us to uh, provide reuse uh, access over the long term. We in turn are responsible for curating these data and for making them freely available to all users for any purpose, um, including commercial benefit. Uh, NERC will allow researchers an embargo period of up to two years from uh, the end of your data collection period so that you can work ex exclusively on, on the data and publish the results before uh, other people have access to the data. Uh, to read more about the policy, uh, there's a link also to the website. Uh, so our work on curating the data, um, this uh, covers all aspects of environmental science. Uh, so that would include uh, digital data, indexes and lists, models, physical specimens, sample materials, and some third party materials as well. And, and our data assets include many unique, irreplaceable historical data sets, which provide a valuable resource for new, new environmental research and innovation. And to uh, establish which data we would be interested in, uh, we also have um, a data value checklist, which will help researchers to determine the likely long-term value of the data produced by the research projects. And it also helps, uh, helps researchers when you're, you're pre preparing a full data management plan, uh, so you know what you're uh, offering to deposit to the EDS and what are the requirements. The support that we provide for all researchers, uh, how do we fit into this? Uh, once uh, the NERC and uh, the research project have agreed their funding, uh, we as a service uh, reserve a list of these funded grants and we contact the uh, principal investigator of, of each grant uh, to initiate a discussion on what is in scope for data management planning and uh, what we uh, both expected to be happening over the project. And we work uh, throughout the uh, research project together with researchers to help them uh, document the data sets and to ensure that uh, the data that we get into the uh, environmental data service is fair compliant. So it's findable, accessible and reusable uh, and also inter interoperable in the long term. Uh, the other word in my uh, talk title was research data management. So let's have a look what that what I mean with that. There's a lot of literature out there to help you look into that. Um, so uh, research data management, uh, the uh, Kirsten Briney book is an excellent resource for researchers in particular. And uh, she uh, talks about uh, uh, RDM being accumulation of many small practices that you make a routine part of your research and they are one element which help you make your data fair so easier to find understand uh, and more likely to be usable uh, in the future both by yourself and uh, other uh, reusers and 
the Cox and Verban uh, book also uh, looks at uh, our perspective, so uh, EDS perspective, um, how uh, the data is created, uh, how it's made findable, organized, stored, shared and preserved, but that applies also to any research process. And uh, a concept that's uh, a bit newer than the RDM is data stewardship, um, which um, is uh, consists of the people, organization, and processes to uh, ensure that uh, all the appropriately designated stewards are responsible for the governed data. And that may uh, refer to different types of data stewards. So they may be technical, looking after IT systems and applications, domain stewards who know their particular data domain, or operational uh, stewards which support these uh, projects. Why is this important? Why do we need to manage research data? So first of all, it, there's the here and now for the researchers. It helps you do better research and optimize the use of your data during the active research. Um, and also help, helps you collaborate with, uh, col uh, collaborate with uh, other researchers, whether they are locally or internationally working with you. It also helps in the long term because it ensures that uh, the data is preserved for future and uh, it's uh, easier than to discover it, interpret it and reuse it. And it sustains the value of the data because there's a lot of work going into creating and collecting it. And finally, the uh, um, transparency and demonstrating value. So this is important for the funding agencies and also research journals. So they require uh, the data to be uh, tracked and uh, demonstrate the impact and the return on the investment. Um, I find this DISC uh, RDM lifecycle a very useful way of looking at uh, both the researchers' input to the uh, research data and the uh, repositories and catalogues. So uh, first of all, the uh, EDS provide all the support from cradle to the grave. So whether it's from the data creation, the planning, support with planning and designing your management, uh, then the uh, researchers are doing the collection and capture um, and collaborating and analyzing. Then at the end of the project, uh, we come in to help manage and store and preserve uh, and also uh, with the uh, publishing and data sharing in the long term and uh, then uh, ensuring that your data goes into uh, appropriate data catalogs and registries so that it can be reused and cited, again, increasing your research impact. So uh, we provide advice in the beginning of a uh, program, in the kickoff meetings, training and guidance throughout, helping with the management, data management planning, and help you to get uh, the copy of the data to the data centers. Um, I'm not going to through, through, go through all of this, but it's showing you uh, the key activities that researchers themselves are involved in. So there's an awful lot of uh, work going on, and I'm going to mention the resources required a bit later in the talk. So it just doesn't just happen. There's an awful lot, lot to think about. And the earlier in the project you think about it, the better it is. So you don't need to wing it. Um, I'll leave it there for a couple of minutes so you can have a look at it. Um, I will cover these in later slides uh, in a bit more detail. Also important, uh, there are rules and regulations uh, that uh, we all need to comply with. Uh, you will all hopefully be familiar with these key pieces of legislation. So the Freedom of Information Act, FOI, there's the EIR, which is the Environmental Information Regulations, and also the famous GDPR or Data Protection Act. And for if you are not specializing in legislation and law and records management, these can be a bit daunting. But uh, the good news is that NERC EDS, we have the expertise in this area and we can handle requests for the data that we hold. So that's another good reason to ensure that your data comes to the data center so you don't need to worry about these. Uh, a little bit more about the EIR in particular. Uh, the reason being because uh, of obviously uh, most of the data we have, if not all of it, is environmental data and uh, it comes in scope for the uh, EIR regulations. 
uh, and the key point uh, to think about is there is a presumption that all these data will be available to all people who request them unless there is a clear reason supported by the law as to why they should be withheld. And this, uh, this piece of legislation is the most open of the three, so uh, we may have to release uh, data and uh, I can talk about that later if you're interested. Also of interest to the researcher who puts a lot of work into the data uh, generation is the intellectual property rights. So whose data is it uh, at the end of the day? Uh, the uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act uh, talks about uh, research related outputs. And most of these come fall under literary work and they are therefore protected by copyright. Databases, uh, which are a common output, they may be protected by both copyright and database right. Um, however, um, facts or ideas as such cannot be copyrighted. The uh, usual uh, retention of copyright is 70 years after the author's death, uh, computer generated work 50 years and ground copyright even 125 years. So. Uh, the uh, IPR is quite uh, a long-standing uh, piece of legislation. How that fits into with the uh, NERC data policy. Uh, IPI in the data that the researcher generates, uh, well, it depends on the researcher's contract of employment. So uh, usually the uh, employer of the researcher owns the copyright, the IPR. So if you work for NERC, it's uh, owned by NERC, the university owns uh, university staff uh, data, but it should be uh, in your contract of employment. Um, and the uh, policy requirement of depositing your data with NERC does not affect the IPR, so you are not handing that over to us. Uh, however, you will uh, be required to grant us a non-exclusive license so we can manage and supply your data for reuse in the long term. Uh, I mentioned database uh, copyright in the earlier slide and uh, the TNA, so the National Archives, uh, ex explained this as a database is a collection of independent works arranged in a systematic or methodical way. So uh, this is about the extra skill and labor that the author needs to organize the data in a database. So it's not only gathering the information, it is the uh, intellectual investment in uh, presenting the data content in an original manner. And the databases are protected for 15 years from the date of uh, publication. So that's something that you may be interested in. I also mentioned that uh, we uh, require a, a data license so that we can share the data and make it available. So any data that uh, we make available is accompanied by a license which outlines any limitations on how the data may be used, uh, how the source or the creator must be acknowledged, and also uh, the limits of the liability for the reuse of the data. And uh, at the moment, uh, we are using the uh, Open Government License version 3.0. If you want to lead, read more about it, there's information on the National Archives uh, website. But in brief, uh, what uh, people are free free to do is copy, publish, distribute and transfer all the data we hold. They can adapt it and they can exploit it, whether it's commercially or non-commercially, but they must acknowledge the source of the data in their product. Um, so reuse rights then, if, if the data is under copyright, you can reuse it, but not republish it. Uh, if you have op obtained your data under a contract, which sometimes uh, you may uh, state in the data management plan, there may be more restrictions and that may uh, supersede the copyright legislation. And uh, if uh, you use data which is not clearly licensed, you will need the permission to republish the original data, so uh, make sure you've got that. Right, that was the first bit about the NERC context. So uh, in the remainder of the talk, uh, we are going to look at uh, the uh, research data management best practice. So we provide uh, trading and information on the website. So this is a quick run through of some of the things that we advise uh, grant holders on. First of all, the uh, 
data policy states that you must agree a full data management plan with your uh, dedicated data center. And this is not a one-off uh, document, it's a living document throughout your project that must be kept up to date. It's, you can call it a roadmap to your uh, project plan and related data and outputs, or a record of how you manage your data. And it's also an agreement between you and the repository on how, you, how the data is uh, managed and uh, transferred at the end to maximize access and digital continuity. Emma mentioned uh, my uh, digital preservation project, so that's uh, one of the key aspects for us as well. And your data management plan should include information on the following areas of, of your data management. So a data collection, so what types of data, what formats, uh, what volumes, uh, how you manage data quality control, for example, so uh, your variables and units of measurements, um, any vocabularies and standards you use, how do you collect your collection methodologies, uh, folder structures, etc. We will look into this in a future slide. It will also have something about your metadata and documentation, what information is required uh, for future users to be able to interpret your data and how you will capture this information in your projects. Information about your storage and backup. So uh, during the active research project, where is the data kept? How, uh, what is your backup regime? How do you control access to it? Have you considered your security risks and data transfers? Preservation planning, so selection of data for long-term storage, uh, what effort is required, how long is the data kept, uh, what do you get rid of, how do you dispose of data. Data sharing, again, during and after the project, so uh, you need to think about your discovery metadata and licensing, data citation and DOIs. And finally, the responsibilities and resources required, which is often just an afterthought. So who does all this and who is uh, down to uh, for us to contact, for example, very important. Um, then we are having a look at some of these areas that uh, you are going to think about as part of your data management planning. As you collect and uh, create your data, you need to start organizing your data. So. Uh, we don't have a blueprint for a system for you, but it's important to have a system and use that system consistently. Um, and key points about that are uh, you always need to put your data in the right place. So you decide what is the master location. Um, so you or your team may work across multiple machines. So have a system which uh, mandates everybody to store the data in a master location, in a central location when they finish their work. And do not uh, store that on, on your laptop hard drive or a USB uh, horror, shock horror. Um, your best system, however, will depend on your research workflow. And there's as many of these workflows as there's research projects. So please talk to the EDS because we can uh, help you with any uh, queries you may have. Uh, but a good system is also simple and flexible, so it's easy to use for you and your team. Um, one thing about uh, re research, uh, organizing your the research data is in the planning. Uh, so uh, folder structure is something that um, I'm told new uh, researchers may not be very familiar with because they use big bucket. However, in STEM uh, field, uh, folder directories are, are still very important, and you can structure them depending on what your data is. So, for example, by your dates, sample numbers, uh, instruments, data types. It's uh, up to your your research workflow again. Um, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. What is in a name? Uh, organizing your data also includes developing your naming strategies, and these will apply to all files, folders, and physical samples equally. You uh, need to think about this in advance uh, to make it work uh, using consistent names within the project, because this helps you avoid duplicate data, um, if, especially if there's many people working in the project, and also at the end makes it easier to sort out and analyze data. If you have different uh, data types, um, 
you may decide to have uh, several naming uh, conventions in your project, not just the one. So what information should go into your, your name? So you need to think about all, all your data variables and how to document them clearly to uh, make it easier to interpret your data. Uh, examples of good naming file, uh, file naming strategies are first, don't have too long names because uh, if you start moving data across different uh, platforms and systems, they may cause trouble. So try to uh, design a strategy which has up to 32 characters um, and which are also consistent and specific if the data file is moved from its current location to somewhere else. Um, best practice is to use either capital letters or underscores uh, in between the words so uh, don't use spaces or especially special characters for dates it's best practice to use the iso standard so year month date and uh, to help you uh, include as much information as possible if you have used acronyms initials etc document them in a text file readme text file uh, because those 32 characters will not include everything. There's just not space. A um, couple of examples there of uh, a file name. Obviously, I've used whole words there, but you may have acronyms. If you haven't thought about this in the beginning, there are some renaming tools, but it's easier to do this from the beginning of, of your project rather than do uh, the renaming at the end. Um, also important, not just the data itself, but uh, when you offer us your data, we ask for a metadata entry to accompany your data and consider this as a roadmap to your data. So uh, the key fields include the title of your data set, which needs to be a very clear and concise indication of the content. So people looking at the name a title understand what your data set is about. So it needs to be understandable, brief and simple. However, if you use acronyms, abbreviations, they need to be explained. Uh, if there's no space in the title, then data description can be used to capture that information. And the description then, or it can also be called a data abstract. It's a summary of the content of your data set, which allows the reuser uh, to determine how relevant and useful the resource is to them. It is <coughs> written in clear English in complete sentences, not fragments or bullet points. That is not good practice. A good description will tell the users um, some of these things, they are not always all relevant. Most of them are, however. So what is the data set about? What's been recorded? What form does the data take? Uh, geographic coverage, if it's relevant. Data collection period. Um, the uh, collection or creation methodology. Why was the data collected? Uh, what's the purpose? Uh, who was responsible for the uh, data collection and interpretation? Uh, did you actually take some data away from the data set and why did you do that? And the lineage statements. So uh, when you go and deposit the data, these are some of the questions that uh, you need to uh, answer uh, before you deposit the data. You may also provide some additional data documentation that you have uh, collected and generated throughout your research. And they may include <coughs> various different types of documentation. From research notes, um, there's um, Darwin's uh, page of research notes as a little illustration. Uh, the research method, so how you acquired your data set, set step by step. Any laboratory notebooks, um, read me text files, they can be used for any, anything that uh, you find them useful for. And you can create templates of them so you can use them for the next project as well. Any data dictionaries and databases, so uh, if these are necessary to uh, understand and interpret your data, you can offer those to EDS as well. I mentioned <coughs> data protection earlier in the legislation, and this may not always be relevant to environmental research, but if you are working on um, interdomain research or uh, doing surveys or interviews, it's something you may need to consider. So uh, is your data sensitive? Do you need to collect it? Uh, if you don't, 
do not collect it at all. And if you need to keep it, make a clear plan how you protect it and keep it secure. And don't just do it once, but review it regularly. And think about who's going to access it. Do you need to encrypt part of the process? When can you destroy the data? And do all people involved understand this? So is there a training requirement as well? Data security is a slightly different aspect because it's more about restricting access to the data. And there are some strategies, as, and while we have a look at this, Think about how many of these strategies are you already using in your own data management work, because failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So <clears throat> is your software up to date? Is your anti-malware and firewall up to date? Do you always practice safe computer usage, such as strong passwords, not sharing those passwords? Do you need to control and lock access to your data files or use uh, encryption? And in the end, destroy unwanted data. Some examples of strong passwords are three random words. So purple knitted sweater, don't use that though, make your own. Number of words, two special characters. Again, uh, something that uh, makes sense to you. Um, at Tanook uh, and BGS, we use the two-factor authentication. So that's something if you have access to, please use that. You may also have a password, pass password manager uh, which uh, there's an example of. Uh, this is not a recommendation, it's just uh, as an example. Data storage and backup. Uh, so this uh, is both about the active research uh, and after the project, the long-term storage. So in active uh, phase, uh, you may have your data on network drive or hard drive or in the cloud. The data is fluid and it's therefore at risk. It may change. In the long term, a storage where the data is preserved at a repository, that means it's the final safeguard version of the data. I mentioned the uh, backup earlier, and uh, if you are not using 321 backup, he here is what it means, and uh, it's a very good thing to do. Have three copies on, of all your important data on at least two different storage media, and one copy in a different geographical location, because uh, loads of copies keep your stuff safe. If you, even if you lose one copy, uh, you will have other copies secure in your other locations. So, uh, and also you need to test your backups. Do not just rely on it working. You need to test it. And if somebody else uh, manages this for you, a storage pro provider, check with them how often they back it up and uh, consider what is difficult to replace. So the more valuable your data, the more important it is to back it up. And part of that is also your file versioning strategy. So uh, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the uh, uh, method of having ordinal numbers for a major version and decimals for minor changes. So 1.0 is the original uh, published one. 1.2 has had some revisions. Then 2.0, second approved version. Never ever use labels such as revision, final, 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 definitive copy, because next year you will not remember what those meant. Also, you may work in different uh, storage locations. Remember to sync your versions so you don't need to start looking at uh, dates and uh, trying to establish which is the final version of which you can discard. And do discard any obsolete versions that are no longer necessary. Sharing a cake. It's easy. Sharing a data doesn't just happen with a fork and knife. So you need to think about a future reuse. Can your colleagues find your data? Can they understand what your data is? Can they use your data now or in 10 years time? Or for that matter, can you use your own data in 10 years time? What you can do to make this easier and uh, use, more usable for your colleagues is uh, those things that uh, we covered earlier about uh, naming convention, metadata and documentation, uh, providing that clear user license and access to the data, protecting your data from unauthorized users, and storing your data in a readable format to maintain that long-term accessibility. 
if you're working in a collaborative project, there's a little bit more to it than just uh, managing your own data. You need to think about those other users. So you may need those data stewards uh, man managing and herding, not, in, not cats in this case, but little signets. So uh, the, again, you need to, in a research team, think about and agree on those uh, naming conventions, data versioning, so that everybody is doing the same thing. Uh, any uh, common file directory structures, file formats, any conventions that apply on your data collection. So plan all of those layouts before you start, instead of having to tweak them th uh, later on in the project. You agree uh, where the data will be short, uh, uh, stored and also who owns that data if uh, several organizations are involved and whose responsibility it is to manage the data. Um, I mentioned resources are important, so you need to think about this uh, early on as well. All the time and effort that needs to go into this work uh, from creation to management and implementation of your DMP, the people and skills that you need to manage this uh, data management work uh, from um, data analysis to quality and to then the collaboration and the uh, storage and technology so managing all the backups, uh, security, and also software models and code, uh, that's also in scope. Before then, uh, back to the uh, uh, EDS. Uh, so before you come to us and offer the data, uh, I mentioned the data value checklist, so you can use that to help you decide what data to offer us. And there's also an awful lot of best practice guidance, both on the EDS and individual data centers websites. So please go and have a look there because a lot of uh, answers may already be answered there. A lot of questions may be answered there. Um, and think about those additional documentation and metadata, which uh, I mentioned earlier. So you can't just dump everything at the data center in the end. You need to prepare to make it a good quality, valuable data set. And you may even prepare a data uh, transfer action plan, which uh, has, this is an example, so your action plan may be different. You have your up-to-date data management plan, so check if that's up-to-date so the data center know what they're after. Ensure you uh, have, are entitled to deposit all the data that you have, or do you need permissions? Can it be all shared? Have you named uh, your data appropriately used suitable long-term resilient file formats, uh, divide your data into meaningful units because large deposit may cause trouble during transfer. So think about how big your deposits are. And do you need an embargo period at the end of it or is it open straight away? Um, and once you have given the data to us, um, NERC uh, expect uh, the access to data underpinning research publications to be provided uh, and it's mandated by both publishers and funders. So uh, there will has to be in your publication a statement on how the supporting data and other uh, research outputs and materials can be accessed by reusers. Proper citation references anything created by something else, including the data. The benefits of uh, citing your data and making your data sets and data collection citable. Well, there's, there's a lot of benefits, but I've uh, got a few here. So uh, the uh, reuse acknowledges uh, you as the author, uh, makes identifying the data easier. Uh, it promotes transparency and more importantly, the reproduction of your research results. Uh, for NERC, it allows the impact of the data to be tracked uh, and it also provides a structure that uh, recognizes and uh, rewards data creators. So we help you by providing DOIs for you, which is an internationally recognized standard. Um, we expect that you come to us to uh, ask for a DOI and don't have them minted somewhere else. So we can monitor the impact of the data that we hold. And uh, we facilitate uh, the citation using these. Um, in the last um, statistics, and Kate may correct me if these are out of date by now, um, we had nearly 3,000 DOS minted already last time I gave a talk, and last year uh, over 600. So this, I think, is on the increase. And also where your data is found is in the NERC data catalog service, which is a searchable 
and integrated web interface for all NERC EDS data holdings. And that makes data easily discoverable. It gives a worldwide exposure to a large audience. And there are links to larger data portals as well. So it's not the end, uh, end uh, of your data. There are almost 12,000 data sets available. So uh, if you are looking for data for reuse, uh, please go and investigate there. Um, that's all I had time for today. And thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was a really insightful and, and detailed talk there. Um, it's now an opportunity for those that are, are here and have any questions for Joanna to, to post in the, uh, the Q&A. Um, Whilst you're doing that, um, I've got a couple of questions actually, Arno, if that's, if that's okay. Um, so my first one is, um, how is it, that, how can environmental scientists using the NERC EDS help ensure they follow fair data principles? So that findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So yeah, how can environmental scientists using the NERC EDS uh, ensure they follow those principles. We are enhancing our best practice all the time. We don't stand on our laurels. And uh, one of the key areas is the communication between the data service and the uh, grant holders and their teams. So that's exactly why we want to engage with the grant from day one, so we can en ensure that uh, the fair data aspect is taken into consideration as early as possible and uh, integrated in, in the project and the data management. So it's not coming as an afterthought. So it's integrated, integrated throughout, and that's why it's important for grant holders to, 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 to engage with, with the process we're here. That, that's it, yes. Help. Brilliant, thank you. Um, very quiet in, in the chat. Kate's updated the DOI figures. Thank you, Kate. Or oh, has she? Do you want to? So we, we have over 3,000 oh, now, yeah. and even this year, over 500. So that's brilliant work across the uh, EDS. Uh, I have another uh, question in, in, uh, directed to me in the chat. So, um, can data in the EDS be accessed with an API, or does it have to be static file extracted? Good question. That is a good question, and uh, I'm sure there's a technical member of the EDS somewhere uh, in the chat that uh, might be working on the on that area. I, I unfortunately am not. So, so, uh, so I might be able to answer this. You I might think, be able to, yes, a, a little bit. I might be. Able, so I think it depends on on the on the data um, uh, whether there's a, a an API to access that. So there are some data that are, uh, are brought together through portals. Um, uh, I think there's the uh, there's the soil portal, for example, and I think some of that data is shared as an API. But I don't believe all data is um, available as yet as an API. I think that's a, a sort of uh, a work in progress, and it's based on priorities. Um, Kate, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, just being from a different data centre. Yeah, certainly. Um... It's something that we're actively looking at. It's something that we want to do, but um, and it varies across data centers. So each of the data centers holds quite different data, data, different formats, different sizes. So it might be a bit more applicable to some data centers than others currently, but it's definitely something as an integration activity across the EDS that we're looking at in future. Thanks, Kate. So I've got a, a few more coming through the chat. Uh, I'm just trying to manage the, the QA bit. Um, if you can try and put the questions in the QA section rather than the chat, that, that helps me out. But I've, I've, I can see there's a couple in the chat. So Steve Lloyd is asking, is there any recommendation regarding documentation, etc., associated with data being in a plain text format rather than something proprietary? Um, I can definitely take that. Uh especially on behalf of the uh, NGDC, because we maintain um, a list of uh, preferred file formats on our website, and I'm sure other data centers are doing similar things, where uh, we, um, if, if you uh, provide data in the formats 
on that list, uh, then that's the best practice. It doesn't mean we exclude others, but we may want additional metadata to ensure long term accessibility. So, uh, for example, plain text format. Yes, that's definitely on the best uh, best practice list. Uh, CSV files. Um, PDFAs, things like that. If you have no option but to provide a proprietary format, then please talk to your data center and uh, we'll discuss what additional information you may need to provide uh, about the software that it was generated, uh, the version, etc. Thanks, Jana. So no, another question. Um, I'm interested to hear a bit more about the approach for providing DOIs for for large data sets, exa uh, for example, long term monitoring data sets, what is the approach taken for issuing a DOI? Would the EDS typically provide one DOI for the whole data set or would multiple DOIs be issued for, say, different years or measurements, etc.? I'm sure Kate will have something yeah. to say about this as well. But first, uh, I, I can say that the NGDC may provide you both. So an overarching DOI for the whole data set and separate DOIs for any collection, sub-collections of data. But Kate? Yeah, what Jana said is correct. So we can offer DOIs at a collection level or individual data set level. And really, it's up to the depositor in um, collaboration with the data center to decide on the granularity of what is a data set. So this is a question that comes up repeatedly. You know, what is a data set? What makes up a data set? And it's really up to the individual depositor how they think that users might want to access their data. What is a sensible chunk of data to be putting out there? Maybe it's based on the data that's been used in a publication, for example. So that can be sort of um, drawn out when you're agreeing your deposit with the individual data centers, but certainly we can do both things. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Joanna. So um, another um, question in the chat. So uh, do you have views on other PIDs besides DOIs, e.g. IGSN, Arch IDs? With 16 million BGS physical geoscience specimen, it will be a lot of DOIs. So uh, PITs, are, regardless of what they are, are always a good thing to use because we can always link to uh, the use of those and provide them as additional metadata. But uh, from the point of DOIs, uh, Kate, have you got uh, a comment on this? Yeah, so we use DOIs and we use data site DOIs mainly for data sets. Um, we can use them for other things as well, but maybe it's not sensible. So I know that some of the data centers are looking at things like IGSNs for specimens because some of the data centers and their host organizations hold a lot of physical samples. So they might be looking at more appropriate PIDs for that sort of thing. Um, we're not um, limited to just using DOI, so we could use other PIDs. And again, that is an area that we're um, you know, keeping abreast of and seeing what the community wants really and what we can help provide. Thanks again. Um, so another question I have is how do the uh, data centers or the EDS handle IP in the data sets are provided? Are all the data center uh, data sets open access or are there some that are closed? Um. I'm not ruling out that sometimes there may be a requirement to restrict access to data, but we prefer not to do it. So uh, the uh, first uh, first thing is to try and make all the data openly accessible. Um, so it would be a case by case basis looking at what requirements there might be to restrict that data. Is there anything under the environmental information regulations that uh, we can use to restrict the data? And if somebody challenges that restriction in, in court, we would we still have to release that data? So uh, uh, another thing is to look at it. Um, data products are not in scope for what we take in. So it's mainly raw data and uh, the um, restrictions for raw data are quite rare. Uh, if the data is something that is licensed by, uh, say, the host organization, then obviously that is outside the scope for this. 
Thanks, thanks, Jana. And, and I think Steve's clarified uh, what the PID is in um, in the chat. Should anyone? Yeah, thank you. Presentation on that. So thanks for that. I think it might mean something different. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering the same. Um, yeah, I think there's two things yeah. that <laughs> there are. Yeah, but the, someone's cleared it up in the chat, so that's right. fine. So it's persistent actionable identifiers. Yes, I was going to say I'm not sure there's personal data in the. Uh, borehole records for example so persistent actionable identifiers is, is what we mean by PID there thank you Mike um so oh here we go Chester Sand so does NERC provide access to data management training or oh, I know Joanna can answer this particularly for early career researchers database concepts creation and management are skills many researchers are not familiar with so uh, at the NGDC, we have an annual uh, RDM training course uh, for the uh, PhD students that are hosted by BGS. And uh, we have plans to expand this training. And uh, it's some, something on our agenda to start uh, sharing the training more widely. Because obviously, uh, the data types across the EDS differ. So there will be some modules which I don't currently uh, provide, which would be required uh, from other parts of the EDS. But yes, training is something that uh, we are very interested in providing more widely. I think that, I mean, that, that's a really good point, Chester. And I think um, actually hearing from someone like yourself what you would find useful would be really um, valuable to us. You know, we, we want to try and tailor our services to, to those end users. Um, so if you wanted to um, drop Yana an email with, with any more details that, about what you think you would really benefit um, you as an early career researcher, presuming you, presuming you are, or, or on behalf of early career researchers, um, yeah, please do, do drop one of us, uh, yeah. Put Donna, my Donna, email in the chat. In the chat, please, please drop her, a, a, and we can then consider it. Because, um, yeah, actually, understanding what what's required and and needed by the end users is re is really important. Definitely. Um, so, and you. just to jump in as well, we're hoping to put things like that on our new brochure website, the NERC EDS brochure website. So that's hoping to, to release that early next year. And that's hopefully going to be a place where we can put training resources um, so that not only NERC researchers, but all researchers can access this kind of information. Indeed. And uh, we, I've also just sent to the NGDC web team a long uh, list of resources that we are making available on, on our individual data center website. I don't think it's live yet, but it's on the way of being live. And this will be also linked to the main EDS website. Do we have, oh, thanks, I've got some uh, just comments in the chat. I don't think they're questions as such. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a native a, 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 a point rather than a, a question in there. Um, any other questions? I'll just I'll just wait for a few minutes to see if anything comes through. Do our panelists have any other questions for Yana? You can speak speak out loud because. <laughs> So, should, so before anyone comes in, I should just say we've got a panelist of, uh, of people from across the, the NERC EDS um, and uh, the um, constructing digital environment here. I forgot to introduce them. Um, so Kate, Kate Harrison, for example, is uh, one of our data center NERC. Uh, um, I'm going to get it wrong, Kate, you're going to have to say it, EIDC. Yeah, EIDC, <laughs> Operational Manager for EIDC, that's the Environmental Information Data Centre. So we deal with terrestrial and freshwater data generally. Thanks, Kate. And then we've got we've got Steve Hallett. So Steve's going to ask a question, I think. Yeah, hi, hi um, thanks for that. Yeah, I'm Steve, Steve Hallett, one of the digital champions. Um, Jana, thanks for a, a fascinating talk, really interesting. I just wondered, um, we hear a lot of talk about data ontologies these days, and I just wondered, uh, to what extent um, thinking was uh, had evolved around um, forming data ontologies for some of the data themes that you've you've mentioned in the uh, across EDS. I, I just wondered if where, where thinking was about that. 
uh, again, we have a team of people working particularly in that, that space, uh, both at the uh, data centers and uh, across the EDS. And uh, there will be somebody who is much more involved in that work. So uh, I can certainly find out for you. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting to know. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.